Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in to Discover Church Worship. Let's begin our worship with a song of praise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The good news is that Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for me, and for our sake he forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Word of God, I therefore declare his forgiveness to you today for all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we, we join our voices today with the voices of angels and archangels and all the host of heaven to praise and bless you. And with all of those all around the planet trusting in Jesus, trusting in your providence, O Lord, asking for your help, for your protection, for your provision for us, for the gift of salvation, for the help and strength we need from day to day. Bless our church, O Lord, in its efforts to communicate your gospel, even, at, even as through the media we are doing in these many weeks. Bring us together again, O Lord, to worship together in your house of prayer, a house of prayer for all nations. Lord, we join the petitions of our own personal lives in the words of the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, always oh, free and I'm a child. has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died.
Good morning, boys and girls. It is that time. Come on, get up and get nice and close to the TV so we can see you. And whoa, oh, I'm so, I'm so Pastor sorry. John, you're you're a little bit late. I I was working on the other end of the uh, the building and I lost track of time and I just I ran all Ooh. the way here. Whew. Looking Hold a on. little I, parched there. I am. I could you hand me my water bottle? I, sure. I'm sorry, boys and girls. I just need a little water. I know. Good. Okay. Uh, there, there's not a lot of water. There's not in a lot there. of water in there. I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. Uh oh. I'm really thirsty. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this with my mouth so dry. Well, you know, in the Bible it tells us that God provides for our needs. Well, and I, I need water. So, how about if we pray for some water? I think that's a great idea. Let's try yeah. that. Let's see what happens. Why don't you put this down? Yeah, and we'll okay. just cover it up here. <sighs> okay. And no, I pray. Okay, I'll pray. Yes, God, you know, we've said in the Bible, right, it says that you provide for our needs. And God, my, I have, my mouth is so dry right now, and I want to be able to talk to these children about, about you. And if you could just provide me some water, that would just be incredible. Amen. Amen. Let's see. Oh, man, it didn't, it didn't work. It didn't work. I thought God was supposed to provide for our hey, needs. Oh. Hey, John and Christy. Oh, hey, Miss Jess. I don't know why, but I just really felt like I needed to bring you a bottle of water. Oh, would you look Whoa. at you? Thank you, Jess. You are an answer to prayer. God just provided oh, for our needs. That's incredible. Hold on one second. Mm. Wow, thank you, Miss Jess. Well, you know what, boys and girls? We kind of did this whole thing here today because you know what? God does provide for our needs. And you know what? We can trust the promises that God gives us. But here's the deal. God may not always provide in the way that we want or in the way that we think would be best or in the timing that we would like to see. But in our Bible story at home today for your lesson, we're going to see how God is always faithful in his own way and in his own timing. So we're excited for you to learn more about the promises that he has for your life today. Genesis 22, 1 through 18. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw a place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him from withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me.
Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for reading that scripture. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we uh, come before you realizing that you are working in our world when we see it and when we don't see it. We ask this morning that you would open our eyes to how that is happening and that we would realize that we're a part of that rescue mission. In your name we pray, amen. So God's rescue mission is the theme for this late summer sermon series. And one of the things we have learned so far is that the mission is not almost, is not immediately apparent. It's subtle, undetected even. It's very much like a pregnancy. The mission in many ways is like a pregnancy in that you don't recognize it at first. And then once it's recognized, it takes a while for it to be fulfilled, that pregnancy. And it's still pay- taking place through us. Each follower of Christ is pregnant with God's promise, God's gospel, God's rescue mission. And so that means that you're pregnant with that promise. Now we come to a story where it seems like God himself wants to abort the mission and kill the promise. It's the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, which we just read. You know, this is one of those stories that it didn't faze me as a child. It was a story that... uh, Bible story that was told to me in Sunday school like a bunch of other Bible stories like David and Goliath and uh, the uh, crossing of the Red Sea and all the other Old Testament and New Testament stories. But studying this story in seminary, I was horrified. You see, my senior year in seminary, I had a baby daughter And I was responsible for watching her in the morning when my wife went to work and before I took her to daycare and went to my classes. And this story just seemed to run counter to God's character. How could God ask any parent to sacrifice one of his his children? You know, I thought about that as I was studying, and I remembered uh, uh, an incident uh, just a couple weeks before. This is back in seminary. Vicky was had been really sick, very ill. She had been fussing and crying and all of the things that go with being sick, and she had a fever, and that morning, Pam had to go to work, and she passed the baby off to me, and I, I coaxed her, and she was just so tired that I was finally able to lay her in her crib, and she fell asleep. And then about 45 minutes later, I looked in on her, and there she was, and this is when it got really scary for me. There she was laying in her crib, her eyes wide open, not moving, not making any sound, just laying there. And I felt her head and the fever was still going and, and, and her eyes were just kind of dull, listless. And I was really concerned. And I started praying at once. As I called the clinic, which thankfully was very uh, close to our apartment because Pam had our only car. It was only about a half mile away. As I called the clinic, I was praying. And as I bundled her up to take her to an emergency appointment, I was praying. And as I made the half mile trek across a snow-covered field, I was praying And as I went into that clinic, I was still praying. And as I checked in, I was fervently praying for my daughter, praying to God that God would heal her. 
And I just couldn't imagine that if God answered my prayer, he, he would then turn around and ask me to sacrifice my daughter. The story of Isaac, when I read it in seminary, just horrified me. It seemed to run counter to God's character. But you know, that is why we should never take a story out of its context. That every story that we read, we should keep it in the context of the Bible. And with this story, particularly the context of Jewish scripture, the Old Testament, and particularly the context of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible where this story is found. And if you do that, if you read that, the story of Isaac's attempted sacrifice in that context, it has a very different meaning because what you will discover is numerous passages about the abhorrence of child sacrifice. Here, let me give you just one that is in Deuteronomy chapter 12. And the Lord is uh, talking to the Israelites just before they enter the land and he's talking about the people and how they worship idols in that land. And he says to, or Moses says on behalf of the Lord to the people, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way because in worshiping they, their gods, they do all sorts of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their God. In short, God would never demand that type of sacrifice. The story of Isaac is a story that underlines that God would never do that. Yes, the story is dramatic and it has this cliffhanger ending that you don't know what's going to happen the first time you read it until you discover the ram caught in the thicket. Yet one of the points of the story that Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, are different than the idols of the nations that are surrounding him. In fact, oh, by the way, let me uh, share how the story ended with my daughter. So I get to the clinic and I check in and I unbundle her and I sit down still very uh, worried with her sitting on my lap. And all of a sudden she starts to, boo to, to move and to gurgle and to babble and she climbs off my lap and there are toys, one of those windy things, you know, with the, the wood circles on it. And she started playing with that and she got more and more excited and happy so by the time I was called into the doctor's exam room, my daughter was a happy one-year-old, enjoying life. God had answered my prayer. I was overjoyed. However, I was a little embarrassed to try to explain to the doctor why I had made an emergency point, appointment for a happy, healthy one-year-old. Really, Doc, she was very sick when I bundled her up just a couple minutes ago. But God answered my prayer. So if God would never demand that kind of sacrifice, if this story isn't about sacrifice of Isaac, then what is it about? Well, really three things that I want to talk about. First, anything before, placed before God is an idol. Second, trust in God's providence no matter what. And third, it's God who sacrificed for us first. 
So let's look at each. Anything you place before God is an idol. You know, idols aren't just those ancient wooden statues or stone statues or those statues of marble you can still see in uh, places like Corinth and Athens and uh, Rome. No, an idol is anything, anything you place before God. It can be all sorts of things. It can be habits, good or bad. It could be ideologies. Notice the word. It's cognate. Ideology is cognate with idol, which means it has the same root word. Even a relationship can become an idol. Now, let me say, with the exception of bad habits, none of these things are bad in and of themselves. They become bad when we place them before God. Because then they become twisted. And they are put in a spot they were never meant to be put into. You see, when you give supreme importance to anything, then it becomes an idol. You know, let me just give some concrete examples. A bad habit's obvious. I won't touch that. But a good habit or a life goal, which should be good and should motivate you, but sometimes we put that above everything else. That is where we get our self-worth. That is where we look for our purpose in life. That is where we put all our effort and energy. Like weight loss or going to the gym, which is something I'm trying to work on. But if I put that above everything else, then that becomes an idol. And that's not good or a particular ideology. You know, if you put an ideology at, at kind of the top of your pyramid and you use that ideology to judge every thought and relationship, and every thought and relationship has to bow to that ideology, or the thought has to be rejected and the relationship has to be broken off, then that ideology has become an idol. Or even relationships. The close, the personal relationships that we were created for can also become an idol. You remember the movie from in the 70s, Willy Wonka? I know there's been, two, there's been a remake of it. It's based on Roald Dahl's book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Well, you know, that's a wonderful example how a relationship can become idols. Do you remember Charlie is this wonderful kid who's had a rough life, but it's just his heart is as good as gold. But all the other kids that uh, get the golden ticket and get to go into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, each one of them seem like spoiled brats. And as you look at the way the children and the parents interact, you see who's at fault. It's the parents. Because the parents have made their children's idols in their life. It's their supreme importance. Everything else falls by the wayside. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't love and take care of your children. Absolutely. That's a God-given responsibility and a God-given gift. But that God-given gift, if we place it too high, if we place it above everything else, including God, we can turn our children into idols and truly hurt them. You know, back to the story. Abraham could have easily fallen into this trap. You see, because Isaac wasn't just a child. 
a child in his old age, a child, the joy of his old age. No, Isaac was a child of the promise. The promises that God gave to Isaac, Abraham, were going to be made real through Isaac. So Abraham could have thought, well, I don't need to put God first anymore. I've got Isaac. As long as I take care of Isaac, the promise will be fulfilled. But Abraham doesn't do that. He makes sure that he keeps his relationship with God and he doesn't turn Isaac into an idol. Here's the reason God doesn't want us to get trapped by idols. First, idols twist and destroy, destroy you, whether those are an ideology or a habit or a relationship or a life goal. They twist your life, their, their, your, your perspective and your thought processes. So you end up doing things you never thought you would do. You end up taking actions that you would, be abhor would have been abhorred at a little er before you started worshiping this idol. Again, I go back to that Deuteronomy chapter. You know, God did not create parents so they would offer their children as sacrifices and burn them. God created parents to nurture and care for them. You see, that's what an idol does, is it twists your perspective. It twists your thought patterns. And eventually it can end up destroying you. But the other thing to realize is that all idols die and disintegrate. Besides, idols, you know, idols are not eternal. Just like those ancient idols that surrounded Israel that have all turned to dust, so will those things that we idolize turn to dust whether that's a habit or ideology or a life goal or relationship. There's only one eternal reality. And that's God and his providence. And that brings me to the next point. Trust in God's providence no matter what. You know, providence is a an old-fashioned word. It was used a lot at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. But it's a word I would like us to start using again. And it simply means God will provide and to trust in God's provision, whatever that looks like. Abraham's response in the story is a perfect example of that providence. When Isaac asked him, you know, we've got the wood, we've got everything except the, the sacrifice itself. And Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb. God's providence. You know, we're in a similar situation in this crisis right now. And we need to trust God's providence. Because God will provide. Might not be the way we want God to provide, but he will provide for us and for our church and for our state and nation. God will provide. And what we need to do is trust, trust that provision. Another way of saying it is that we live, and I've said this a couple times this summer, that we live that petition of the Lord's prayer, your will be done. We should live our lives accordingly. Live our lives saying each and every moment we think of it, God's will be done. Because we know God will provide. You know, I came across a great Bible verse in the book of James this week, as I was reading, studying, 
and that just gets at this. And it's a wonderful way, I think, to, to live your life each day. And this is what James says, and he's in uh, James 4, 15. He's in, it's trucks, he writes, instead, you ought to stay, say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. God's will provide for us. Not just now, but also through death and into eternity. The final thing is, we can be confident of that because God sacrificed for us first. Yes, we might make sacrifices for God, but any sacrifice we make is a pale thank you to what God has made already. You know, when the early church, the early congregations that Paul started and the church fathers began to read their scripture, which was the Jewish scriptures, and they came to the story of Abraham almost sacrificing Isaac, they were fascinated with the ram caught in the thicket. Why? Because they felt that the ram caught in the thicket foreshadowed Christ's willingness to go to the cross. That Christ was willing to die on the cross for us, to take our place. That God in his divine purpose, his divine providence, was willing to come down, to live on this earth, to face all that we humans face and a good deal more than most of us face. To face the anger and the hatred of the religious and political powers and to take that all on the cross for us. Any th sacrifice we make is a feeble thank you. That God's sacrifice for us first is essential. Because when we're afraid or doubting, we can look to the cross of Christ and know that God was willing to lay aside everything and endure the cross. And if he is willing to lay aside everything and endure the cross, he will provide. Despite our doubts, despite our fears, God will provide. Trust that provision. Amen. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Morning, everybody. Pastor Vicki Epper here, Director of Hospitality Ministry, and I just want to say thank you for joining us in worship today here with the live recording. I got some really exciting news to share with you. Starting August 30th, we are beginning phase two of our re-entry here into the sanctuary. That means whether you're at the cabin, at home, or here in the sanctuary, we'll be worshiping worshiping together at the same time. We'll be here in the sanctuary and then kicking off our live stream through our YouTube channel. So look more for more information on our website and in your email and have a great week. Read my lips.